Welcome to another episode of the Emulsion Podcast, a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and I'd love to continue the conversation with you from this episode on my online circle community. There you can share your two cents and learn about supporting the show on justinkana.com slash support. For your convenience, it's also linked up in the description of your podcast player. Let's get into the show. What is up, folks? My guest today is Matt Platt, a person that I've had the pleasure of being on his show many months ago in the pandemic times, and he has a new book coming out. It is called Restaurant Marketing That Works. It is, of course, linked in the show notes, but we talk all about marketing in this episode. I am super fired up, actually, after coming off of the interview because not only did we talk about some really tactical things that restaurant operators and anybody who wants to get the word out and connect to their customers on a more deeper level and in a a more sustainable, less transactional way, we also talk about lifestyle stuff and working with intention, and I really, really hope you enjoy this conversation. If you enjoyed this interview, a person that I interviewed that I really think falls in line with this where we talk about work, but yes, we talk about personal stuff, is my interview with Don Wynn, and so if you want to go ahead and check out that episode, that will also uh, be in your podcast player if you want to search that episode up. If at any point you would like to check out Matt or any of these specific linkable things that we talk about, book recommendations, restaurants, XYZ. Those will be available in the show notes down low or on justinconnor.com slash media. I'm going to get out of the way. Please enjoy our conversation. Matt, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, sir. I hope we can maybe start by not just dispelling some myths, but providing some value right from the jump because you're in rec- restaurant marketing like nobody's business. So I was curious, what's the number one mistake you see restaurant owners make when it comes to marketing? The biggest offender. Biggest offender is how I ended up with this ring on my finger. When I met my wife 26 years ago in college, I asked for her phone number the first time we really had an interaction. If you think about restaurants, what's the toughest thing to accomplish to get somebody to trust in that they drove to your place, they passed their go-to Mexican restaurant to try yours, walk in your door, have a great meal, great service, and the biggest disservice you could do is not find out who they are. And it becomes this very transactional thing. D- double click on that for the people that it's it's not quite click because I, I, I you and I know where this is going, but like the explain a little bit. I had a question about your um your whole thesis on having a customer database. And so maybe like if it's not too much to ask to jump right into that. Let's do it. Keep going. Yeah, so I look at it from a standpoint that the the biggest asset you can have as a business is your database. It's my database that I used in 2008 when I launched my digital marketing company, helping restaurants on Facebook, was my customer list from 1999 when I sold radio advertising. Wow. I had it all in this program called ACT. I don't even know if ACT is still around, but I used ACT. I had it in there. I had their names, their phone numbers, their fax numbers, their email address, their websites, their birthdays. And when I started my company in 2008, when I got out of the boat and RV business, I used it to activate my business. And it went from here to here really fast. And so I look at a restaurant is that if I owned a restaurant, which in two years I will, we'll have a restaurant in two years, about a mile from our property here where our headquarters is at so we can practice what we preach. Congrats. But it, I would do whatever it took. Like you would have to leave with an injured knee and a baseball bat to it for you to get out of my restaurant without me knowing your name, your phone number, your birthday, your email, your anniversary, how often you've come to my restaurant, if, are you brand new? Because at the end of the day, I call it uh, aim and expect. Most restaurants have hope and pray. I'd rather aim and expect. If I'm going to grow my business, I'd rather aim at a segment of my audience and expect an outcome. I would rather not just go, you know what, we're going to open up today. We're going to put a post on Facebook and, you know, the internet gods are going to put customers in our restaurant. It's almost like there's two facets to this that I'm, I'm noticing as you're talking about this. There's one element that's like, the tools that you use and those change over time. You expressed one that you've used back in the nineties. And then, you know, like there's a a, a slew of like CRM style softwares uh, these days that people can pick up and use, but it's almost like you have to have the switch flick in your head to almost rethink how you approach work, you know, communicating and interacting with your guests at the foundational level. Have you kind of in your time speaking about this and educating people about the value of this, has there been anything that's like, Oh, this, I, once I say this, people really get it. 
And this, this is how we're going to get people to kind of like really convince themselves that this is going to be valuable for them. I, I haven't found the secret pill yet. Because <laughs> uh, he, here's what I run into. I run into, oh, people won't give me their information. That's, that's too much right, to ask. Or, right. Okay, well, don't tell them, hey, I'm going to give you a free Coke with nine entree purchases <laughs> if you give me your name. Give them something valuable. Give them a free pizza. I can't do that. I can't give my food away. I'm like, so would you rather have Matt Platt come back 50 times or five? Well, 50. Well, how's that going to happen? It's going to happen by a premeditated marketing plan. That plan revolves around two opportunities. One, you hope and pray they see a Facebook post or an email or not even an email, a Facebook post like that. Or you have their information and you have their email and their cell phone and their birthday and their anniversary. And you know that Matt Plapp is a first time customer or Matt Plapp's never been or Matt Plapp comes every week. And so when I have that conversation with them, the analogy that does get their attention is the dating one. I say, you know, I met my wife in college. I met her in the training room because my friend was hitting on her all the time. And she said, hey, will you tell Tom that you and I are dating? I'm like, yeah, okay, Tom, Christian, our date. He left her alone. Well, then like a couple of days later, I saw her at study hall and I'm like, it's a good idea. We should probably date. And I say, what is your, what's your name? What's your phone number? What door were you in? We started dating. We then went on a bunch of dates. We got engaged three years later. We got married a year, two years after that. We had kids. Businesses try to skip the whole dating thing and try to have babies right away. Like, hey, I don't know who you are, but you're standing near my restaurant. Come in here and eat for the next 10 years. So whenever I talk about that analogy, if you need to, in order to date your customers, you got to know who they are. And in order to progress that relationship deeper and deeper, you've got to know more about them. And I think that's a huge flaw is that everybody, they spend all this money. I had a restaurant the other day, they spent $1.5 million on their build out. Wow. Fanciest booths you've seen, these awesome tables. They got a gorgeous sign. Guess how much money and effort and plan they dedicated to acquiring customer data when the restaurant opens? Zero. In fact, the one owner was telling me they were on Word the night before the restaurant opened doing their menu. Oof. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, that doesn't jive. So I, I think that it's, uh, you know, when they say you, you, you plan to fail or you fail to plan. Right. And I think the biggest problem in all of small business is that we've created transactions, is that everybody's a transaction. That's like when, when the pandemic hit, I had a batch of customers that did awesome. And I had a batch of customers that did average. The common denominator was these average ones were a transaction. This was one lady that owned eight locations and she went to each one about every two months. This location over here, Brian Picard at Fatty Smokehouse in Moore, Oklahoma, he's at it every day. The customers that walk in, he knows their name, they know him, they have a relationship. And I think that's a huge element of it is, is the relationship and versus transactional. And I think the way you get away from transactional is by getting to know your customers. There's a piece that I, I heard, I'll, I'll call it maybe about a year ago, and you're the perf perfect person to, to riff on this with me. But I heard it, I heard this anecdote that was, all marketing is, is consistent communication with people that you have established a relationship with, which in, in my mind, was a complete flip from I, coming up in the industry had always thought of marketing and sales as being almost like the same thing. They Venn diagram in a bunch of different places. Um, but I think that that really flipped it in my head of not thinking that every single piece of communication that you have with your customers has to be the hard sell. It has yeah. to be the, you know, the kind of like, hey, you need to spend money in order to make this marketing effort that I've done as a quote unquote a success. But yeah. that that's really in line with what you just outlined for everybody here. Yeah, it's it's funny because tomorrow I, I'm I'm flying to shoot some uh, our TV show down in North Carolina, and I told my team I was going to read the first printed copy of my book. I I haven't read it yet. I've read the manuscript. I wrote it. It's been a year and a half process. And I'm going to read it tomorrow. And, and somebody this morning I was on a podcast said the bad part about reading your own book once it's done is you realize the stuff you left out. And one thing we left out of this book, which I literally am just uh, I'm beside myself on it, is an acronym that we use within our company. Our company is America's Best Restaurants. That's our media company. Uh, the acronym we use is ABR, America's Best Restaurants, ABR, but also Attract, Build, Retain. Got it. That, that the three-step marketing plan for every restaurant. The book talks breaks it down deeper into five, but the three most basic elements are you have to attract attention, 
You have to build a database off that attention and you have to find ways to retain that database, keep them coming back. And something you said there reminded me of a conversation about four years ago. I was talking to this guy named Peter Wiley. They have a brand called Hothead Burritos. And we were looking at the marketing that we were doing for them. And we have you know, Facebook Messenger and text and email and Facebook ads and Instagram and in-store marketing. And we had come up with a cumulative number of impressions that we were making per month per store. And we were looking at it. And he said, Matt, that's the only number that matters to me. He said, because at the end of the day, if people are inter interacting with our marketing, email, text, Facebook, whatever, uh, or the in-store, if they're interacting with it, they're seeing our name. The more often they see our name, they'll eat more often. He said, so I look at it this way. If, you know, Justin sees our marketing somehow a hundred times a year, it's going to influence him to eat here X amount of times, let's say five times. So if he sees my marketing 500 times a year, it's going to increase his visits from five to 25. Right. So at the end of the day, all you got to do is attract attention. But the key element kind of goes in order for me is you can attract attention all you want, but it's going to cost you more money the more times you have to rent that audience. That's why I talk about building. That if you use Facebook, for example, and you market to people that like hothead burritos and they interact with the mechanism and the call to action in your ad, like, hey, comment below or click below for your next burrito free. Now you get their information. Now you can talk to them on your terms versus Facebook's. But then that last part is what you hit there is our retention strategy. So we have a team. Our company has four main teams, account management, then attraction build and retention and tanya heads up the the retention team and what we look at every month is we're going to talk to our four our customers four times a month we're going to talk to the customer database four times a month the first week of the month is new customers the second week of the month is frequent customers the third week of the month is lost and the fourth week of the month is everybody but we also talk to them in a different manner every week like if you think about it most companies if you look at the average restaurant let's say they have a database of 2,000 people and let's say they're actually using it that means 52 times a year, they're going to send a thousand people this, a message. All of them get the same message and all of them get it every week. And it's about me, 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 my restaurant, my menu, my this. You look at your database and break it down. That's not going to impress a new customer. That's not going to drive them into the restaurant. A frequent customer doesn't really care. They already come to your restaurant. And so I like to tell our customers, that you know what? 60% of the time you talk to your customers on Facebook, text and email, and Instagram and YouTube and Snapchat and TikTok and LinkedIn should be about them. You know, uh, a good example is Mother's Day. You know, it's one that always sticks in my head because it was I, it just seeing it really worked well. It was back in April. Uh, we had a lot of clients that did it, but this one client that I happened to be going to see, I watched theirs really close. And I was going to shoot a podcast with them, and they had a Mother's Day post that went up, and it talked about. We want to know your your memory of you and mom. Drop it below in the comments, a picture and something that reminds you of your mom. And then we had an email, a text that went out about it. None of this said eat at the restaurant on Mother's Day. Right. None of this said here's an offer, a reservation. It literally just said go to Facebook. The email said go, click below to go to Facebook and tell us a memory of your mom. And it had that one. I want to say it's like 240 people had commented. And these weren't just like Jeez. my mom's awesome. It was Here's a picture of me and mom at the XYZ festival. We did this, this, and this. She's so special to me. Here's what she did. When people engage at that level, that's priceless. And what I tell clients, I just told somebody this morning, a customer called me and said, hey, asking advice. They got a restaurant that's struggling. I said, you need to impact 600 people a year at a deep level. And they said, 600, what do you mean? I said, what? We need tens of thousands. I go, no. Because if you can literally get a database of, let's say, three to 4,000 people and you can have deeper relationships with 20 to 30 percent of them, all you've got to do is convince about five to 600 people more a month to come in. And if you can find those 500 people that love your product, love you, love what you stand for, 500 more visits a month at, let's say, 20 bucks a pop, do the math. It's $10,000 in incremental sales, which is about $7,000 in incremental profit at 12 months a year is your salary. What I love about all this stuff that you're outlining, and this is a perfect segue into the question that I had for you, is 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 the practicality of all of it and the way that you kind of break it down and really kind of make it digestible. And I, I really dug into your content as, as research for our time today. And before I ask you to dig deeper on some of the topics that you've been recently posting about on social media, I, I wanted to pay you a compliment effectively on something because I think it's so interesting. You've done such an incredible job of getting super practical and um 
mindset focused, yes, but also tactically focused because a lot of people need one or two, one of two uh, ways of convincing themselves. Yep. You aren't being fluffy or being a showman with your content. You get into like, how does takeout food hold up? Offering discounts. Does that make sense or not? Making sure your space has a spot for guests to take photos and post about the restaurant. Hiring a good general manager, supporting your team. These are all just like topics I pulled off scrolling through your Instagram. Where does identifying practicality come from for you? That relentless desire to get to the heart of things. Where does that come from in you? It comes from kind of a weird place in that for probably three years, I trained a lot of, I got on accident when I wrote my first book, uh, Don't 86 Your Restaurant Sales. It was meant to be a uh, a, a tripwire of sorts. Like, hey, yep. restaurant owners see the book. They like the content. They know they can't do what's in it. We're going to call Matt Platt. We're going to call his team. And it ended up attracting a lot of people that were digital marketing, that were marketing people. And so next thing I know, we've got a thousand people going through training courses. And so here all of a sudden, I'm in a, I'm a, an influencer in that space. And I wasn't meant to be, and it didn't, that wasn't me. And I'm at conferences, I'm seeing things. And I'm, I'm watching people that are number one, talking about stuff they don't do currently. And number two, talking about stuff that isn't practical. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll never forget the, I won't call the guy's name out, but it was, com <laughs> it was comical. I'm at a huge conference, a big conference that one I spoke at the next year, but I'm in the front row the, the year before I'm with about 20 people and the guy sitting next to me is getting ready to speak. And he looks at my name badge and there's a code on it that uh, was a messenger code. So not the QR code, but Facebook had their codes before QR codes took off. And he was speaking on this topic at a Facebook conference. And he goes, what's that on your badge? And I looked down, I thought I had like tomato sauce or something. I'm looking at my badge, I'm like, what? That? What? He points at the code. I go, scan code? Yeah. Like, this messenger scan code. Oh, okay, cool. That's How does it work? I tell my FDMIT my team look at it. Next thing you know, they call him up. I didn't know he was the next speaker. He wow. walks up on stage and speaks for 35 minutes about using Facebook and Messenger. I'm like, well, I want to go, dude, you, just, you don't even know what this is. Like, I've heard of fake it till you make it, but like, you're not even trying to go that route. You're just trying to appease and get on stage and i see that a lot you know uh i see a lot of people i mean everybody's an influencer everybody's an expert uh, and i don't pretend to be a restaurant expert i don't know the restaurant business anywhere close to what restaurant tours know but i know the practical side of it and i've watched it i've sat in clients restaurants for three hours and watched and said okay 30 customers are in here why are the servers not asking for their information what is the headache? What's the bottleneck? Like, why is this promotion going to work or not work? And so I, I think to me, it's rooted in the fact that I saw there's so many people right now post. It's easy to post on Facebook, on Instagram. I can really like somebody the other day, one of my kids uh, friends was giving me crap because I only have like 1400 followers on Instagram. And I said, I'm fine with that. I could go buy a million tomorrow. I don't care about a million followers. I care about quality followers. I care about people that grow organically. I said, because most of the people you see online, it's fake anyways. That's right. There was a guy on YouTube that reached out to us about doing a, vent, vent, uh, a joint venture. And so I looked him up on YouTube. And he had literally like 70,000 followers. I'm like, okay, that's good. I look at his videos and they got five views. Mm -hmm. So I've got like 2,000 or so followers and I get a couple hundred views when a video goes up. This guy's got 70,000 <laughs> and like his mom's watching. Totally. So to me, it was a quick sign that he literally bought his audience and he really wasn't what he thought he was. And so I think there's a lot of stuff out there, unfortunately, that's buried like that. And I think there's a lot of people talking about cool, new, trendy things that you know just aren't practical. They, they don't happen. Right. Could we pivot to talk about the book for a second? Restaurant Marketing yeah. That Works. Why, why write this book? Why write this book now? So I had started writing the book about a year and a half ago. I've written five books, two of them, three of them we've published now. Two of them are in a binder on a shelf. One of them's terrible. Uh, I wrote it. I, it was it was like I was writing a book because I had to write a book. Your own and worst got, critic. And I got done with it. I'm like, this sucks. Like, So we didn't publish it. And then I wrote another book called Create Your Own Radio Station. And the concept of it is that all of us have the ability as small businesses to have our own radio station, meaning an audience that you control, the audience that follows you. Well, my publisher's like, dude, nobody's going to Amazon and looking up, create your own radio station. So 
when I wrote my first two books, uh, Don't Eat Six Year Restaurant Sales and Sell More Slices, they were probably too tactical. Like some of the stuff I gave in there, nine out of 10 restaurants couldn't actually put in place. And that was part of the idea of it was, hey, this is going to show you guys something really cool that helps restaurants and like sell more slices specifically to pizza. The whole book had pizza restaurant case studies that you should be able to take to a person like myself or another business and say, hey, look, I want what's in this book. Uh, and so when I, when I was writing Restaurant Market at Works, I, I had some feedback from a lot of people that really liked my content. And I appreciate your kind words, by the way, earlier. I hear from a lot of people that they, you know, I don't have a huge following. I'm not, you know, John Tampers of the world or those guys, but we'll get there. And, but I try and give real world advice based on what we actually do. And so when I looked at my third book, I wanted to bring a book out last year before, even thinking before the pandemic hit, was, it was basically Restaurant Market Networks, Back to the Basics 101. And my thought was, restaurants are all infatuated with a lot of things that are not helping them move the needle. They're buying advertising on the radio. They've got an awesome app. Like I had a restaurant the other day has an awesome app. I'm like, that's cool. Your website's terrible. Ouch. You haven't posted on Facebook in a month. Your email list is dismal. And nobody's downloading your app. And so I looked at it and said, okay, I want to get businesses focused on the basics. You know, I call it the cell phone graph. If you look at the cell phone graph, like if I were to look at my phone and turn it on, there's going to be five bars. Well, I can't get to the top bar of peak performance of my signal unless I get the basics. And to me, the basics for a restaurant are an awesome website, a solid Facebook and Instagram uh, presence, uh, tools on your website that capture people's information, tactics inside your four walls that arm your employees with ways to have conversations to get those people's information. So I was looking at all these elements and I said, I'm going to write a book, Restaurant Marketing That Works. It's the name of one of our divisions, ironically, and that's kind of where it came from because we named the company that for that. But I said, I'm going to write it. It was back to the basics. Well, I got the book written. I had two chapters left last fall, uh, fall of 2020. And my publisher called me and we're talking about it. He goes, hey, what did you have to tweak in the book uh, to account for what happened during the pandemic? Nothing. So what do you mean nothing? Like there was all this, you know, everybody was uh, shifting and changing their model. I said, dude, everything we did, everything in the book worked before, it works during, and it worked after. It, it worked 10 years ago. It's just different mediums, like you said. Right. You know, it might have been a fax automation 10 years ago. Uh, and by the way, somebody asked me to fax something to him the other day, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I was like, we don't even have a fax. I don't even have a phone line here. Yeah. <laughs> And so, actually, I lied. We have one in the elevator. We have right. an elevator in our building that I found has a phone. It rang the other day, and I know we have it for the, I guess, the emergency. But somebody was calling it. I'm like, okay. But when I was writing the book, and I told him, I said, it worked before, after, and, it, and during. I said, so when I wrote the book, part of my motivation behind it was to not get as tactical as I did the first two books and complicated. And so I focused on the five pillars to me. Like, I talked about track, build, and retain. Well, there's two steps in there I didn't mention is you know yes attraction on the front end the second part is is building the database the third part that was monetizing it is understanding that you've just built an email list of a thousand people are they actually walking in the restaurant and what are some ways to monetize what are some ways to understand that and then the next part was getting more data like don't just stop there if somebody engages in your in your you know your sequence that you're using to talk to them find out are they married do they have kids do they come to the restaurant at lunch or dinner and then the last part is retention is, is using the data. But I wanted to give restaurants literally examples. And in here, there's case studies, there's QR codes. It literally goes to conversations and you can see actually this is what they did. This is how they got these people on, uh, to follow them on Facebook. This is how they got their attention in the restaurant. This is how they use this mechanism on their website to get them to take an action. And then here's the path. So my big vision was just to give people a roadmap that – Literally, I can promise any restaurant, any business. I mean, you can say restaurant, but you can say, you know, massage parlor marketing that works. Yeah. You can yeah. say auto repair marketing that works. The fact is most small businesses suck at marketing. The book, obviously, at least from, from how I'm hearing about hearing uh, you speak about it, is directly targeted towards like either the owners or like the real operators or the ones that control that side of the business. But I'd be curious – to hear and you, and you might not actually have a good answer because I, I certainly haven't found something that um, I can actually recommend to people who because there's a lot of folks Matt that listen to this show who are in culinary school they just started their first job in a, in a restaurant kitchen 
or you know they happen to have be, have been behind the bar at a place for two years and they don't get asked to do any of the marketing but had i been able to be a little bit more savvy earlier on in my career about starting to wrap my head around some of these concepts when it comes time to do your thing you're gonna get asked the question you're gonna uh, have a moment where you get asked should we co start to collect information and if that's the first time that you're thinking about marketing i think you're really setting yourself up to to be a couple of steps too far back so can you speak to that person who's maybe early on in their career about thinking about marketing even if they don't feel like they are quite ready to start marketing yet yeah so I would actually put that across to any business strategy. The one thing I, I talked to somebody the other day and the guy said, I don't read. So what do you mean you don't read? And he's like, I don't read books. And I, and, I, and I was that way seven or eight years ago. It was like a badge of honor. Like I'm a, I'm a badass. I don't need to learn anything, you know? And it took me to probably my early thirties, probably about 10, like I'm 45 now, probably 32 to 35 that I got through a lot of early success had a crash, started building myself back up. And I also realized that I was I was handicapping myself in the future because my my knowledge base was staying the same. And so I read every morning for the most part. I have a, a little alert on my phone. I have, you know, I wake up this morning, I went to a coffee place, read for a half hour, took some notes, gave my team some advice. Sometimes I'll post on social media, something I found. But I would say is that person you're talking about is not only, not only arm yourself with that on the, the marketing side, Arm yourself with that on like David Scott Peters book that talks about the financial aspect of it. You know, understand the back end, the ramifications of, you know, overstaffing a kitchen and understaffing it. You know, I think there's a lot of little things. I think, unfortunately, people come into jobs poorly equipped with a depth of knowledge, but don't come in there and be a know-it-all. Just come in there with enough to be able to add to the conversation. Uh, but I would say from a, a marketing aspect of it, if I was that person I would want to come in with a good ground groundwork of, okay, this is the foundation. And I'm not a genius at this stuff, but I can look at the restaurant and see what they're not doing. You know, I eat out a lot. I don't know if you eat out a lot, but I eat out literally probably 15 to 20 times a week. Yep. Wow. And I That's crack a lot. up. <laughs> that is a lot. I crack up. We don't cook at our house. Yeah, yeah. Literally. I think, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think this weekend – no, we didn't have a single meal at our house this past week. Nuts. Seven days. Yep. Yep. Just, that's my wife. We have two kids that are a little older. My wife's like, I'm done. I don't really care. Yeah, I have a kitchen. That's fine. I'll pop a DiGiorno in, some Pop Tarts occasionally. Right, right. right. But that's cooking at our house unless I make ribs or steak. Uh, but when I think of the restaurants I've visited in the last seven days, like how many of them, from an appearance standpoint, impressed me? The coffee shop I was at this morning that's new near my house, I marveled by everything they've done, like the parking, the parking spot dividers, I'm like, man, they're so clean. They're, they're, they're in line, the, the lines, the bathroom, the pictures, the toilet paper's not out. When I walk in there at seven in the morning, the soap is filled from the night before. Uh, I told somebody at Panera the other day, I have one near my house. I walked in and I was there like six 45 in the morning. They opened at like six 30. There was no soap, no <sighs> paper towels and no toilet paper in the bathroom. And I Ouch. walked out and said, hey, by the way, you might want to smack your closers from last night in the head. <laughs> what do you mean? I said, go in your bathroom. Like, they, they didn't help you guys. But then you also might want to look in the mirror because you didn't open correctly. Right, right. But from a marketing standpoint, you can look around. And when you read something like this, it'll get you walking in and going, man, there's nothing on the tables asking for information. There's nothing on the walls, like, uh, showing what the Wi-Fi is or how to get the Wi-Fi. Scan this code. They're talking about celebrating a, an next event, like catering. How many restaurants make a lot of money and, and market very well with catering events? And there's nothing to catering. So I think it arms you at that level to be able to ask those questions and say, hey, why aren't we doing this? Because like I tell my team, when we go on a com have a conversation with a restaurateur, don't, don't study them at all until you get on the call. Because there might be reasons they don't do it. I had a rep one time that came in with this awesome lunch promotion for a client of mine about five, six years ago. It was awesome. It was probably one of the coolest merchants I had seen at the time. Problem was, this client didn't serve lunch. <laughs> and so I'm like, at some point, you want to come in and find out and ask questions. But I think to answer your, your root of your question is, you know, have enough of a base that you can look around and, and ask articulate questions about why aren't we doing this or are we doing this or not. I think it uh, this might resonate with folks who you cost out your dish 
you cost out a dish for the first time. You end up doing a food, a food costing on a dish on the menu or a special that chef tells you to run or you just happen to... The first time I had to do it was as an assignment for, for culinary school. And after the first time you do that, you can't look at restaurant pricing in the same way ever again. And I think you're saying something to the effect of like, get the foundation down so you can look at something that either made you make that reservation for Mother's Day when you needed to go out with your mom and you say, oh, I did that because of clever, of good marketing. And it's not, I, I, even I caught myself there saying the word clever marketing because it's like you, you need it to stand out. But at a certain point, um, Tim Ferriss has this great exercise as he talks about doing sales and marketing and copywriting where he collects ads that made him buy. And then when it's time for him to do a marketing plan for a new book or, or, or a new product or what have you, he pulls that as information as like, oh, th that's interesting. That made me take action on whatever that company wanted me to do or that business uh, wanted me to, uh, call, the call to action, basically. And so, um, yeah, huge fan of that as a, as a practical tip for folks. Oh, I, I subscribed, uh, not for the political, because I care less about political, I subscribed to a lot of political stuff in the election years. Because it, it, I mean, they got some stuff that gets you to open. Engagement. Like, I a couple, Engagement. couple times I open, like, what, well, did I actually do that? Like, look at the subject line. Like, are you, did I just donate my wife to, to, to the Republican <laughs> Party? And I'm like, oh, never mind. You know, yeah, it, there's there's something to be said about that that Tim Ferriss talks about is, you know, saving the stuff that gets your attention, saving the examples. So I've, I have taken, I've asked, I've been at restaurants before, and I've seen something really good and said, hey, do you have an extra one of these in the back that you're not using or maybe that's dirty? And they're like, yeah, well, I'm like, well, I'm in the business, and I, I think that's a really cool promotion. Well, it's like uh, use the best of what others have already figured out, right? Like don't feel like you have to start from scratch. Like marketing, yeah. like we're saying, has been around for decades, so don't. Well, you, you know, what's exciting to me, like you asked why I wrote the book in some minutes, is that I can promise you if you're a restaurant person, a marketer, nine out of ten restaurants aren't doing 90% of what's in here. Yep. And it just – absolutely amazes me and the other part of it and this is the sad part about it because we do with a lot of franchises i we have probably half our businesses independents half franchises the unfortunate part about the franchises is that they're depending on a corporate office that knows less than them and that's not a mean statement and little i deal with it we get blackballed by marketing directors like they literally they'll call up oh you guys can't work with that company well why not well it just it's against the brand standards or do we, they're not a certified partner of our, our franchise and i call up, how do i get certified oh we're not interested so i've got a product that's helping well, like we have actually this happened we have one one brand four locations two of the top four in their entire system and the only thing they're doing different is working with with us and our tactics and this marketing director just because she didn't know it because she didn't comprehend it, because she didn't want to see somebody else get praised, which is comical, because her job is to find people and tools that help the restaurants. But that's a bad part, too. But that's what it's exciting to me. I tell people all the time, like, the two biggest people that are your competitors, you know, in the restaurant space, so your competitors down the street, and then also the corporations, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Uh, they're antiquated. They're, you know, one of the business I ran across the other day, they're force feeding their app to their franchisees. And it's a pretty good brand. Force feeding it. It's gotta happen. Online ordering this, this, this. I asked, I said, what percentage of your clients are using the app and ordering online how they're wanting? 12%. I said, oh, they want you to abandon everything else to focus on 12%. I'm like, that's like me going to the gym and just doing the left tricep extensions. <laughs> I'm just I'm gonna come back. I got a funny story on that, by the way. But <laughs> It just that makes no sense to me. So I think the cool part about like people ask me like, why are you in the restaurant space? Why did you not? Because we could have picked car dealers. We could have picked a lot of stuff, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. We, you know, since 08, we've been doing it. But 2015, we made a decision. We're going completely restaurants. And it was going to took us 2015, 2017 to really transition. But I said, because there's opportunity. People eat every day. There's locations all over the place. And most of the people that are out there don't have a clue. So if we can get in front of a restaurant tour, and arm them with things they can do. And if they just do 20% of it, they'll beat the pants off the guy down the street. I have two more tactical questions for you, but to, to switch gears quickly for, for, for a hot second here, you've been a really big proponent of hard work, but doing it in this very intentional way. And I think that you and I would agree that hard work absolutely gets you there, but using hard work as the only thing you're optimizing for can often lead folks to get to a really negative place. And so my question for you is, 
how you've grown to have a really solid grip on your work and not necessarily finding that elusive word, the B word, the balance word, but being motivated to do the things that you've brought up in this call of like waking up at 6 a.m. to go for a jog or scheduling time to read or, you know, any of that, like what's been helpful for you in, in, in getting a better grip on work? So a couple of things. I'll, I'll give you a, a what was the name of the podcast I listened to the other day. I listened to a podcast. You ever heard of Rob Geerdeck from uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. MTV yep. Ridiculousness? Yep. The dude, of course. I always do him from Ridiculousness and skateboarding. He's from like an hour and a half north of where I live here. But he was on a uh, podcast the other day. I'll boot my phone up and uh, look at the picture. I have a picture of it. But he was on a podcast where he talked about hacking his time and hacking his happiness and all that good stuff. That's kind of what got me to a point where I'm at today is the fact that I I don't do what I don't want to do. And I think the negative with, let's just look at restaurant owners. You know, this space, my office, we have a 9,000 square foot office. There is, the top part of it is a about a 2,500 square foot shared workspace. And I looked at our space and said, we're going to make this top part open free of charge to anybody in the restaurant space because they're always stuck in their kitchens and their restaurants. They're not ever getting out and, and having team meetings the right places or learning correctly, in my opinion. Uh, and I think that was a, that's kind of the, the part that ties me back to it is that I got out of my business. I don't actually do very much in the day-to-day -day of our company. We have 40 or so full and part-time employees. We had a team meeting this morning with, I think, about 14 people, and we talked about a lot of cool stuff. And I gave my input on two or three things. They won't talk to me again on next Monday at the next team meeting. Uh, I don't send our clients emails, texts, Facebook. Now, at one point I did. I had to work my butt off years ago to learn what worked. But now I'm at a point where I'm working on my business. I'm no longer an employee of my company. And I think that that's what blocks a lot of people is that they're employees of their company. And that's a key element is that you can't be an employee of your company. You've got to run your company. And if you run your company, you have the cool thing. You can eliminate stuff you don't want to do. Uh, and Rob Deerdeck, I actually created a little landing page on my phone. So Rob in this podcast talked about every day for the last year. He was talking about since 2014, so seven years ago. Every day he puts in a little chart of 1 to 10, how he judges his day on life, on health, and on business. And then when it's, you know, let's say it's a four or five or six, like he made a comment in there, like, he's like, man, you have a bad day. And you're like thinking, why did I buy this car? I'm going to sell my car. Like it was influenced by something. And you know, you don't, it's not the right decision, but you're just not in a good space. And so he makes notes on what happened that day. And he's like, then I look at those notes and I eliminate that. You know, when I have a bad day like me, I've noticed that when I eat certain foods later that day, I don't feel as good. I'm groggy. I get mad. Things irritate me a little more. I'm not as happy. And so then when you log it, you go, that made this. And so it's the same with work. There's things in our company that have to be done that I just don't enjoy. You know, I don't enjoy calling customer or calling prospects, you know, to talk to some guy that owns a restaurant about maybe working with us. That's just not my jam. Like I, I think I've gotten, I've graduated past that. It's not fun for me. I've done it. And like I did a meeting a couple weeks ago and one of my guys wasn't doing the call right. I said, watch, I picked the phone up, I called, I did exactly what I would have done. I hadn't done it in like five years and it worked. And he's like, oh man, it's genius. Okay, good, see ya. But I think when you can understand your days, and I know for me, like I literally, I set alarms on my phone the night before. My goals, I, I set an alarm for six o'clock. Uh, I get up, I do some type of little exercise. Like we have a pool and a hot tub at our house. Like this morning I did some gymnastics on some rings for 10 minutes, nothing hardcore. Uh, swam 10 laps in the pool, which isn't very far. It's like 20 meters. So not even probably that long. Uh, and then I got in the hot tub for 10 minutes and just sat there and thought. Alarm goes off at 6.30, which means I got to get up, get a shower, get up. I would need to be in my car by 6.45 at the coffee shop by 7, re read a book, get to the office by 7.45, 8. And so I, but I've done all that because I know that when I wake up early, when I get moving, uh, one thing I got from, uh, I can't think of his name now. My mind's going blank. Uh, but drink, chug a bottle of water right when I get up. Right. There's all these little things. Yeah, yeah. And I found that when I do that, it helps me. And it's the same way with business, is that when I find that I do certain things and then I eliminate other things, you don't have to work harder. You have to work, there's that whole thing, work smarter. And you know, you still do have to put the time in. Like, I'm going to fly out tomorrow morning to North Carolina. 
I've got 13 episodes of our TV show and a podcast I'm filming in two days. My goodness. It's a lot. I mean, that's, that's right. People don't realize, like, when I, like, I did an interview like this earlier for 45 minutes. I got done. I went to a smoothie shop, got a nutritional smoothie because I knew I had this one. I didn't want to have any any crappy food in my system. Right. And But I got done. I sat in the car. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, your neck tenses up. Your brain's working. And so I'll, I'll work hard, but I'm intentional with what I'm doing. I love interviewing restaurateurs. I love seeing their restaurants. I love hearing their stories. If I had to be, you know, the person that was driving our van, because we have a Mercedes van that's down there, we fly in, we pick it up, we drive it to places. If I had to be the person driving that and worrying about parking spots, I'd be bored out like this sucks. I don't want to do this anymore. Self awareness. Yeah. And so, uh, and, but I, I, my phone's not booting up, so I don't know what. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can send it to me, and we'll all include it in the show notes if you find yeah, that. Because I tell you what, it's probably the most impactful thing I heard. Because the other thing he said in there was that he also every day answers five questions and his are did i wake up at 5 a.m today did i eat healthy today did i meditate today uh what was the other one did i work out today i think something with did i spend time with my family right and he was talking about how he goes in and he looks at all the elements he's got a grab he said that this year up to six months he's 87 percent of the time he's done all five of those things wow and he said, those are the five key elements. Like me, I program, I literally have a landing page that only I have. That I started doing uh, yesterday. It was the first day I've been kind of building it for a week. That I go on there and answer one to 10, those three categories. I then make notes of what impacted those one to 10. Then I've got, that I get up at 6 a.m.? Did I move today? Did I eat vegetables? Because I typically forget to eat vegetables all the time. It's just not my jam, but I had green beans yesterday. Did I eat vegetables? Uh, did I spend time with family? And did I read today? Because I know that if I read every day and become smarter, that if I spend time with my family, if I eat vegetables, if I go to the gym and I get up at six, if I do those things, my day is going to be better than it would be if I skipped them. And you still do this daily because I'm 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 trying to address the person who's like, oh well, there's no way I'm going to keep track of this stuff daily. And what you know, I would probably advise for that person, and what's been helpful for me is to do it like once a month or once a quarter to and, and do it retroactively like you i think you and i and, and rob might have been potentially talking about like oh take a look at yesterday or literally plan your day today what's been helpful for me and you know i don't know if you've done this matt is to kind of take a look at like what did i really hate doing this quarter you know like what yeah. really br like sucked my energy out and just really now kind of like yeah go ahead i'll grab something for you <laughs> So, of course, they're, they're both orange, if you know me. Yep. This is every week. I print off a plan for the week, and then I have a sheet for every day. Very nice. And I make notes on it. Yep. And at the end of the, end of the week, I debrief to see what happened last week, what went right, what went wrong. I then have this is all of this year. Nuts. And so when you can go back and look at things, and it's amazing, just if you're a restaurateur, you know, your restaurant, the what happens in your restaurant all comes off of you. If you come in, you know, like I, I know a guy that runs a restaurant. Uh, I'm not a big fan. of His restaurant's cool. I'm not a big fan of his. He drinks way too much. He sleeps with his employees. Uh, there's some negatives there. And I've seen it for years. And there's a reason his restaurant is not successful. And it's the same way. Like if you look at your restaurant and you say, what vibe did I bring to the restaurant? Was I positive today? Did I have a good day? Did my team? You can look back. I guarantee if you kept stats like this and charted your, your, yourself and you looked back and said, man, we had our worst sales month ever outside of the pandemic. We had our worst sales month ever last month. You could look at it and go, huh, I got up late. I partied all month. I was mad because of this. It's all of that. And like, for me, one thing I can tell you this, like I've, uh, my wife knows this, and I tell my kids, and then we were driving somewhere the other night, and they're complaining about masks or COVID or something. I said, y'all, shut up. Like, they know me. Like, I don't care. Like, I get caught in a little trap every once in a while. We all do. But for the most part, for the last, let's say, three to four years, I have very little conversation about stuff I can't affect. And if I focus on MatPlap, I can focus on me getting up at six. I can focus on me working out. I can focus on me reading. I can focus on me coming in and giving my team positive motivation. I can focus on listening to their problems and helping them solve them. 
uh, that I know I can impact. I can't, I can't, uh, affect, I can't change the things that are going to happen by the morons that are running everything in this world. It is what it is. You, uh, and, but I, but I tell you, when I heard Rob's interview, like it, it was mind boggling because like he took like the depth of what he's studying, and he made a comment. He's like, everybody asks how I do it. They ask for all these metrics. He said nobody has ever done it that I know up to this date as technical as me. And he's like, that's why my days are always awesome. That's why my businesses are succeeding. He's anal retentive with how he spends his days and he, he's literally hacking his life. I have my own kind of like morning s- similar planning session that I do. I don't know if you can share uh, with the audience how long it takes you to do that because I, I don't think you're spending two hours every morning planning stuff oh, yes. out. It doesn't quite take that long. And, and and that's what I think potentially holds people back from executing on this period is they think like, oh, well, it's got it's to take two hours. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. Mine takes less than 10 minutes. Yeah. I mean, mine takes about 30 minutes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I literally got up. It was kind of comical. I was, I was laughing at myself, but I enjoyed it. I did like five to 10 minutes of exercise this morning. I have, some, I have a gym in my basement, but I, I literally, I didn't use any weights. I had the gymnastics rings. I did some dips. I did some things called rollovers. I did some push-ups. I did some sit-ups. I went out and swam 10 laps. I literally accomplished all of that in under 10 minutes with now with no weight equipment, with nothing. I mean, granted, I had a pull, but I could have went out and ran down the street. Uh, I've done that. Like our little poodle next to our house, and I'll tax me some mornings because at 6.05, I'll be outside. I don't wear shoes when I run outside in those mornings because I think the feet on the ground is better. But I'll do some little sprints. I'll do some jogs. I'll do some mobility in 10 minutes. Sure. I mean, it's there's great. amazing, I think, and especially look at the restaurant space. That's one thing that does hurt my soul with the restaurant space. I hope to bring eventually to the audience is that it's an easy space to be out of shape and unhealthy mm-hmm. because you're surrounded like me. I like Mountain Dew. I try to drink it once every three or four weeks. If I walked by a Mountain Dew machine every day and I was having a bad day, I'm like, I need a Mountain Dew. If right. I was having a good day, I'm like, I'm having a Mountain Dew. Uh, it's, it's the, you're constantly around food. You're around, you know, you're around consumers, which are typically negative. You're around employees that are at a different level than you that probably the same way they've got negatives. Uh, or so it's it, tough. Well, it's also, there's a mindset of like, take care of the guest, take care of the guest, take care of the guest above everything else. And it's like, that gets you to a certain place, but it also comes with this funny side effect of like, you don't end up taking care of yourself. And that's really detrimental. I find so. I, I, I heard uh, yeah, I heard right. Snoop Dogg the other day speaking, and it was the greatest thing ever. Everybody laughed at it, but he was serious. You know who he thanked last in his speech? Who? Himself. Nice. He said, last but not least, I want to thank myself. And everybody laughed. He was like, I'm not joking. He's like, if it wasn't for me putting in the hard work, for me taking care of myself, for me doing what I wanted to do, I wouldn't have got here. And I think a lot of times we ignore ourselves, you know, my my mental my mental strength you know like i had a talk with my daughter yesterday if i can't if i'm not in a place where i can have that talk with my daughter she suffers if i can't do if i don't take care of me physically and mentally then screw everybody else it's not it's just going to trickle down we really pivoted to get to some lifestyle stuff there but i'm (laughs) thanks for going down that road with me there uh i'm going to do a couple rapid fire questions but before we do that i have one more marketing question for you which is do you have a favorite success story from using marketing as a tool or as a in a in a concept or maybe the gold standard for restaurant marketing that comes to mind for you as you think about success stories so i'd say my biggest success story is what got us on this path is national pretzel day april 26 2015 i don't know if you've heard this story or not no but we had, uh, I had a client of mine, three locations, a brand called Hot for House, Newport, Pittsburgh, and Columbus. We were spending over a million dollars a year for them on radio, TV, direct mail, billboards, sports sponsorships. Anytime I spent money, and I was in charge of the budget. I was their at-large marketing director. My company was their agency of record. We did all their stuff. My roots of our agency were digital, Facebook, YouTube, uh, video content online, email, text. This is going back to 08, so we were ahead of the game on it. And I'll never forget Nick Ellison, who's awesome dude. He said, Matt, I can't deposit likes. And I'm like, okay, what, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're telling me this YouTube video had 30,000 views. You're telling me our Huffborough House Pittsburgh Facebook page went from 
2,500 fans to 27,000 fans in a year. I can't go to U.S. Bank and deposit that in the bank. So, okay. And he's like, so before you spend any more money on this Facebook thing or email or text, because I had put in a place, uh, put in a system where we were gathering emails internally, like a little virtual, like a little slot machine. You went in, you played video games, and you put your info to get. And they were all mad it was costing a thousand bucks a month. I'm like, we got 3,000 cell phone numbers last month. Who cares? Yeah. He's like, prove to me this stuff works. And then I'll leave you alone. So we literally did a one-off promotion. We spent $50 on three Facebook ads, one for each location. And we sent out one email the week prior, by half price, pretzel and beer cheese this Sunday. Uh, that was National Pretzel Day, you know, great American holiday. And the only way people knew about it was to come in with their phone. They had to bring in the cute. It was the most, it was the basic of basic of bring and show your phone. Well, you, yeah, you can draw you can draw a direct line. It's not like the billboard strategy where maybe they saw the billboard. You you used yeah. a good yeah you picked a good way to track it. And so it did eighteen grand in incremental sales increase over the prior Sundays. One hundred percent. He called and he called me Monday morning. And, it, and Nick's an awesome entrepreneur and self aware enough to say he's right or he's wrong. He called me and said, "I'll leave you the hell alone. You were right." So when I fast forward that to today, because what happened, that put me on a path that said, okay, what did I miss there? Yes, I know that these people came in as a direct result of that email and Facebook ad and post. What did I miss? I don't know who came in. I don't know that Justin walked in. I don't know Justin's email, his cell phone. I can't take him down a path. That's what put us on this point where we did our company. This past spring, around the same time, we did a promotion with a brand called BlackRock up in Grand Rapids. But it was a Facebook post. It was literally, it's in the book. There's a case study in the last of the book. It was scan this code uh, or uh, comment on this post below the amount of candy in the jar. And people comment. And what happens is it does two things. If they comment on the post, and then we also sent an email and a text telling them to do it. So we used our data we already had in a manner other than saying, come to our restaurant. We said, go to Facebook, win a contest. But what happened was everybody that engaged in that post that wasn't in our VIP program, it prompted them in Messenger to give us their information in exchange for four offers. And then the people who were, it said, thanks for guessing. By the way, click below to see your offers. We ended up getting like 20 to one. There's a couple of pages we did this with. The one page ended up getting 2,400 brand new people sign up. It was a $50 total spend over 14 days. It was an email and a text that went out to like 800, 900 people. On those, on those 24, 2,500 people, 500 of them walked in within a month or two. And their average checks 70 bucks. So wow. 500 people at 70 bucks, just on the discounting the fact that we have their name, phone number, email, visit, frequency, birthday. The fact that people engaged in a guessing the number of mints in a bar glass drove 500 visits to me is what marketing is all about. How do I put something out there, get people to raise their hand, and then get them to walk in the restaurant without asking to do business? Because the email, the Facebook post, and the text didn't say anything about coming to BlackRock. It said go to Facebook and guess how many pieces of candy are in the jar. Wonderful. The people, I, I, I can imagine the operators that are listening right now, their heads are spinning right now <laughs> in, in so the I best way. I'm, it's funny. I said, yeah, I said, I wasn't sure because I hadn't read the whole book yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's the post right there. Okay. And it's, uh, this is one of the versions of it. It's on the last. There's actually a page. I think we actually went with the smaller of the two case studies because the one was just 6,000 people commented. I'm like, it's just not realistic to duplicate that. The one I think we highlighted was like 2,200 comments. So sure. still pretty darn good. That's awesome. All right, let's do some rapid fire questions. So uh, my, 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 nor my normal question on this is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a weekend morning and I ask how um, folks make their eggs. But since you said you don't cook at home that much, if, if, if you and the family are going out for a breakfast on the weekend, where do you guys like to go? So my go-to place is Colonial Cottage in Erlanger, Kentucky. The negative is their kitchen caught fire two months ago. It's closed for six months. Oh my goodness! So right now we've been going to First Watch. It's a you know it's a chain, but I think they do a really good job with their food. They get Love their it. millionaires bacon. Love it. What's one thing that you've changed your mind on in recent memory? One thing I've changed my mind on in recent memory: getting up early. Okay. I used to have this mindset two years ago that I'm Matt Plapp. I own the company. I, my health is my, you know, is, is my path. I'm not setting an alarm. And I would just wake up. I wouldn't set meetings below before 10 o'clock, and I would wake up whenever I woke up. 
and I enjoyed that, but I woke up groggy. There was no intention, so I changed my mind on that. Is there a book – you've already pulled a couple off and mentioned a few, but is there a book that's been particularly impactful in your career? The one that I was going to ask you about was Deep Work because I know that you hold that concept near and dear. Yeah, that, that's the book I was going to say. That's the name of this, this shared workspace is Deep Workspace, Deep Work by Cal Newport. It really made me it, it made me realize how much I was dropping the ball on, on my team because I would come in and from eight o'clock till noon, it's email, it's reply to this, reply to that. It's like there's some days now I don't touch anything for four or five hours. And you realize the quality of work. If you sit down and do something for two to three hours without any interruption, that your focus is that piece of work. When you're a higher level caliber person, which I know I am and I know your audience is. You can't be in the restaurant trying to figure out how to run your restaurant and be answering emails and talking to servers and talking to customers and changing, chasing text messages and comment on Facebook. You have to have time every day where it's you and you're in your thoughts. I normally ask chefs that are on the show if there's a technique that they're intimidated by in the kitchen, but I think to adjust this question for you, Matt, is there a new technology or a new kind of um technique in marketing that you're seeing the kind of like early days of it and you're like hmm that i'm i'm, I'm kind of intrigued by that or i want to kind of sink my teeth into that 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 new uh element in your in your sector yeah so that for me is 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 snapchat and tiktok and instagram reels you know i I watch my wife and my daughter consume it. Like my wife, I'll, I'll be in the hot tub at night in the backyard and I'll hear my wife from inside the house laughing and giggling. Like my wife's a five, the same. 10 year old. My wife's and the same. She's on, she's on TikTok. And she, yep. but it's funny as I'm looking at that and I'm trying to figure out how a business takes that route because like we just launched some stuff the other day that got 4,500 views in like two hours for our America's Best Restaurants brand on a reel on Instagram. And I'm like, that's pretty cool, but did it do anything? I don't like just doing stuff to sure. get people to randomly like, or like I watch my daughter, she, the way she uses TikTok, it's like, like, like it, there's nothing there. Yep. Yep. And so to me, I'm, I'm intrigued on how to monetize and grow with that the next couple of years. That's so interesting. I have a last question that is that I ask everybody. And I'd be curious if you have thoughts because of how you interact with the restaurant specifically. But the question is, what do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? If anything comes it, to mind, uh, chronicle the journey video. Gosh, yeah. it just, it's, yeah. it crushes me. Like how many chefs, how many brewmasters, how many operators are not shooting content every day. If I was a chef, the one thing I would do every day is people already know your menu. All you're trying to do is it's clickbait. You're trying to get them to watch. People love food. Like the number one, number two topic all the time on on the internet is food video. If I'm a if I'm a restaurant, like I've got a camera on a tripod in front of me right now. The tripod costs four dollars and ninety seven cents from Amazon. Yep. So didn't break the bank. Yep. Uh, your phone, you, know, you already got an iPhone, and you can get them. The, the iPhone cameras are insane. If I was a chef. I would be not only chronicling that to, from a standpoint of let people see what happens, but also just from a marketing standpoint, set it up. What's up? It's Chef Matt. I'm in the kitchen today as a, your average Monday. But you know what? I'm going to show you what I like to make. This is a burger that's not on the menu. Let's just call it the Chef Matt burger. I do this, this, and this. You know, what I love about cooking food, you can have a 30-minute conversation. I know a lady that went live for like 18 hours. And sold, like literally when the, when the pandemic hit, went live, had a retail store, nobody could come in it, but she did an online sale, just walking through, talking, telling stories. Oh my gosh, I remember this picture on the wall. I think that's a huge failure right now uh, that businesses aren't doing it. I'm, I'm actually going out shooting a podcast in four weeks in San Diego at a place that's a client we work with that has like you know, 100 beers in there on their, uh, in, in bottle, 100 bottle beers, they have like probably 50 taps. I said, dude, you should be doing a live video every day called 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Come Absolutely. On, 99 bottles of beer yeah, on the wall. come on. Okay, we don't have 99 bottles, but we got 47 taps. Tap 32 is zombie killer. Here's what I like about it. Hey, by the way, can't wait to see it. Tomorrow we're going to highlight a different tap. Which one will be? See you later. Awesome. It would take all of about two minutes. And yeah, you're going to suck early on. We all suck at video early on. 
But within 20 or 30 videos, because nobody's watching, who cares early That's on? That's right. That's right. Within 20 or 30 videos, you're going to be really good. You're going to have a vibe. And guess what? It's going to sell product and it's going to teach the people coming up underneath you what's expected of them. Love that. Where can people find the book? Where do you want to send people, Matt? Amazon. Love Amazon. It. Uh, it's it's on there now. Restaurant Marketing that Works. Before, during, and after the pandemic. Uh, I'd love you to re read it. Let me know how you like it. Leave a review on there. Can I give my cell phone number out because people can call me and text me? Well, I'll leave it in the show notes. Read yeah. it out now. 859-743-2408. Uh, That's my cell, 859-743-2408. You can find me, Matt at mattplapp.com, mattplapp.com, mattplapp all over the social media stuff. But you know, if you're an operator or owner that's got a, a question from the book, uh, you text me, call me. You know, I'm busy a lot, but you know, if you text me, especially I can see it and then schedule a time to call you back. Uh, but I think the uh, the opportunities there, uh, the pandemic weekend took a lot of the week out. Uh, there's a lot of the strong that survived. And I think the cool thing about it is that a lot of those people that survived aren't doing anything in the book. I mean, they're just not doing it. I told a guy the other day, I said, imagine when you had to launch curbside and pick up and your dining room was empty because you were 99% dining. And now you had third party. Now you had online order. Imagine if you had a megaphone that you owned to tell 5,000 people instead of the 50 people on your Facebook page that might have saw it. He's like, that would have been, it would have been, it would have been, you know, earth shattering. It would have helped us not lose six figures. So I think the opportunity, they always say that, you know, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Well, <laughs> second best times today is plant a tree. Always fun jamming with you, man. Congrats on the launch. Congrats on the Thank success. You. And uh, we'll have to do this again soon. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. What's up? Justin here again. Because, I mean, if you're still listening, you didn't not like this episode, right? And if that's the case, I'd like to think that you'd get value from the other work that I share here online. It's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week called the 80-20 Edge. That's where I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. And I say it saves time because I include all of the content that I publish that week all in one place as kind of a weekly digest of sorts. Next up, you should check out my YouTube channel for gear reviews, clips from podcasts just like this one, and documented experiences from some of the best restaurants in the world. And lastly, if you'd like to learn about my intense cohort-based professional development focused course, get coaching from me to help you make your next move, or just support the show, you can check out justinconnacom slash support. And if you do support this show already, that's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Finally, it really does help to share a review of this show on Apple Podcasts to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.